Hello, good afternoon and welcome everybody to yet another of our Beyond Pulse Inside Coach Masterclass conversations. Thank you for being here with us on this Thursday afternoon, perhaps morning, perhaps evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us from, um, or could even be nighttime if you're watching on demand somewhere as well later on. But um, thank you for choosing Beyond Pulse as your daily dose of, of education. Um, today, absolutely delighted to, to welcome Dr. Steve Harvey um, and Mr. Mark Wilson alongside myself, Tom Shields, for uh, what is uh, another intriguing presentation from another dear friend of, of Team Beyond Pulse. So uh, for people a little less familiar with Steve, he's going to introduce himself and provide um, a couple of moments or a couple of minute background into what is quite a unique and, and fascinating journey. Um, for people that that perhaps are, are unfamiliar to this point, um, Steve has been an international field hockey coach, has worked collegiately in both the soccer and, and badminton uh, spaces. He's been a coach educator for England hockey um, and obviously is, is world renowned uh, in terms of his research and, and work that he does within academia currently at Ohio University. So um, Steve, we've left off of that, that a youthful Tom Shields used to be uh, taught by you and um, Mr. Michael Sup, who is a, a founder of, of Beyond Pulse, has, has been a, a colleague as well. Um, but thank you so much for for sharing your time with us today. Um, delighted that you're here. People that are listening, please feel free to use the chat function at any time that are here with us live to, to pop up and ask any question that you might have of Steve. Um, obviously, there'll be plenty of time for, for Q&A at the end of, of this presentation. But without further ado, Steve, I'll, I'll turn it over to you and look forward to uh, Games Goldilocks and the chicken and the egg. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And uh, yes, we did get a tweet yesterday, didn't we, that from Carnegie, our Leeds Beckett University, saying former alumni Tom and uh, former staff member Stephen. So we do go back a while and we've met each other in a few different spaces since. So I appreciate the invite and uh, thank you to you and, and, and Mark and other members of the Beyond Pulse team. I came up with a snazzy title just to try and get people in on this webinar. It might be more simplistic, the title, as we get in, <laughs> um, but it, it, but as you say, it does sound intriguing. So it's games, Goldilocks and the chicken and the egg. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey for you know a few minutes. I think it's important to where we're going to go with the, the, the session. We're going to talk about a game-based approach and how it works and some literature around that. We did a literature review and I'm going to talk to what the meaning of that is and think about contextualizing that for the coaches in the audience and then we'll have time as you say for a bit of question. Please pop some questions in if we need to take a deep breath at some point and, and uh, ask a question then that's fine or we can deal with them at the end. So my journey is is like this, it's a bit of a winding road and it's up and down but uh, I'm originally from England as you can tell I used to go watch Newcastle, unfortunately, when I was a child, and but I did go and watch Middlesbrough. So that's Mark's first plug, being an ex-Middlesbrough player. Um, so I'm from a place called Stockton, Stockton on Tees, just next to Middlesbrough in the northeast of England. Um, my childhood is an example of my childhood. So this is my, me in my back garden playing tennis. So I used to go out in the back garden and make up games. I used to play Roger Federer, not Roger Federer, sorry, yeah, Stefan Edberg versus Jimmy Connors. I even used to switch hands with the racket and try and play. Um, and, then, and, then, and then I used to play um, field hockey, as you can see, and I got that lovely perm when I had some more hair. And uh, he's my badminton with my short shorts, so it always gets people going. Um, so those were my uh, things that I was doing. Um, in terms of education, the main part of my education was during my teaching license. So I went to Loughborough, which as some viewers may know is a sort of premier institution for sport in the in the UK. Um, I did my teacher, physical education teacher license there, and then I proceeded to do a master's in physical education and sport um, pedagogy there. And I came across quite a few big hitters in the academic world like David Kirk, Kathy Armour, John Evans, Colin Hardy. Um, and I was taught by people like Brenda Reed and other people who had uh, Rod, Rod Thorpe, Len Ormond, 
and people who had a background on teaching games for understanding, which is where I really got steeped into it. Um, so that's an important part of my journey. And I did a master's where my project was supervised by David Kirk. And um, so that was Loughborough. And then I went to Oregon State. It seems a bit weird to go to Oregon from Loughborough, but I had a professor at um, Oregon State who contacted me about coming over there to sort of run some new courses in their physical education, teacher education program, and particularly one on game-based coaching and teaching for physical education teachers and coaches. So um, I went to Oregon State for three years, and just as I was leaving, I kind of met my wife, but we'll come back to that, and snaked in with a couple of kids. Then, I always love this slide, um, then I ended up in Dirty Leeds. Uh, my son and I are watching Leeds United uh, take, is it take me home at the moment so he loves this um and that's where i spent a few years teaching um in the sport coaching and physical education programs with other professors like bob muir john lyle chris cushion um and these are all people you'll see on projects that i have uh, different names and academic projects and then i went to the university of bedfordshire because david kirk was at leeds and then he was at bedfordshire and i worked with a few other people kept in touch with bob and and Ed Corp, who was a guest on your uh, webinar the other week, he was a student of mine, a PhD student of mine at University of Bedfordshire. And then my wife got sick of living in England and wanted to go back to the United States. So I went to West Virginia um, and I worked a little bit with the doing some research projects with the women's soccer team there. And uh, these are some of the facilities you see in the college um, game. And then I ended up at Ohio university a couple of years ago uh, to and now I'm like the coordinator of their coaching and physical education programs so that's kind of uh, the winding road there um, in terms of coaching when I was at Loughborough um, and I do my master's degree I ended up coaching the women's soccer team there and we won the British universities championship so I'm a national championship winning coach as well and I used to teach a lot of youth elite player players badminton when I was at Loughborough and um, I played for English universities, badminton, and then um, I played field hockey too, and ended up getting, when I went to Oregon and came back, I got involved with England hockey, not just uh, in their junior performance programs as a coach, but also in their coach education, pathways delivering coach education courses and things like that. And it was an interesting time with England hockey because there was a big shift towards game-based coaching and um, it was interesting to follow that path and you see people like Danny Kerry now um, leading the charge on uh, game-based coaching in England hockey have been a big proponent of moving in this direction and a good governing body to follow off from that standpoint. Um, and then I, on moving back to the US, I got involved with uh, Craig Parnham, who is now the uh, Director of Coach Education and Learning there. And um, I've done a bit of coach education work for them. And I also, coach the US men's international um, team, the masters team, the over 55 team at the World Cup a couple of summers ago. And I did work with the uh, England programs in back with England hockey as well. Um, so it's uh, that's kind of that. And my current coaching is these two, not just in the house, but on the field. Um, and these are the shirts I put, um, Aiden's a Man U fan for his sins. Um, and uh, obviously, with being from Middlesbrough, um, my daughter's got this shirt. So I thought this would be a nice connection for Mark here. Um, a man you and a Middlesbrough fan. So there you go. So he can relive his past. Um, well, and I, go ahead, Steve. Sorry. No, I was going to say I coach my son's uh, U11 soccer team and my daughter's U10 rec team at the moment. So I'm kind of still out there doing stuff. Yeah, I was going to say that's the second plug for for Mr. Wilson. So he's uh, he's on fire. He's on for a hat trick. Maybe there's, a, there's another one in there somewhere. Um, no, yeah. Steve. Thank you first and foremost um, for the benefit of the people listening. It's uh, I hope it it gives you an insight into just how fortunate we are to to be joined by Steve today. Um, some of the names that might be less familiar with with you guys, um, the, the names that Steve's just dropped are, are really a who's who of. Uh, of academia in, in the, the, the games-based kind of coaching space, um, games-based approaches to, to coaching and teaching, and also some of the, the coach behavior stuff um, 
as well. And and actually, you gave a shout out to Dr. Cope, and he's popped up on the line as well. So uh, mm-hmm. hello, Ed. And, and for people that listened to Ed's uh, Ed's guest webinar, Steve was one of his five um, five most influential people or, or mentors in his career. So again, that that should speak volumes to to the type of insight that we're, we're about to get. So Steve, thank you. Um, let's let's dive right in. Yeah. So um, what I thought I could do is talk a little bit about some problems we have in coaching from and why we might look to do a game-based approach, uh, which is going to be my answer. Um, and then what does the research say? So we did this literature review project, so I'm going to mainly talk about that and name drop and things like that on the way. So in terms of what's the problem, um, this is where Goldilocks the chicken and the egg come in, right? So we, we usually have a situation where we, we do the three L's, right? Lines, lectures, laps. Uh, and you'll talk a bit more about this, I'm sure, with Sam Snow tomorrow. So we end up being in a situation where we, uh, our epistemology or the way we think about learning is that we need everything cookie cutter, in lines, people doing drills, um, and that's the best way that they learn. And we don't want things that are messy, uncoordinated, difficult to control, complex, and things like that. Uh, I mean, sometimes I always get told to dumb some things down, and I'm like, well, Sometimes you can't dumb something down that's complex, but there are ways we can we can do it within our coaching. Um, so these types of drills right, uh, and running in and out of cones are sometimes called training form practices in the literature. And they're probably what is the chick, uh, the one side of the coin, which is the, the or one end of the spectrum, which is the chicken. And then the other end of the spectrum is the egg. Now I'm not standing here saying we should because we can't have eggs without chickens, we can't have chickens without eggs. Did I get that right? Um, and Goldilocks here is in the middle because we want our porridge not too hot, not too cold and just right. So the idea is that Goldilocks is somewhat the learner and she's kind of stuck in between in the middle, but we need to make sure that what we're doing is just right for the group that we've got. So this gives you some kind of a central theme analogy to what we're going on. So we need to, yes, do game-based coaching and know how well that works, but we can't just say we're not going to do any technical teaching either. But what we tend to find, I'm given the game away from research, is we probably tend to do more of this training form than we do of the playing form. And some of the literature that's out there um, shows that. So here's a, here's a study that we did, just came out, uh, as you can see, 2019, with Gaelic football coaches. And they filled in a survey, 150 of them. Main take home, coaches report utilizing training form activities in the first half of their coaching sessions before progressing to game-like activities in the second. So again, there's this notion that coaches think that we can't play a game until you've learned the skills. So there's certain prerequisites to things. But what we'll learn is that with games, you can represent games and simplify games to make them meet the developmental needs of the learners. Um, and we'll look at how a game-based approach can uh, we can do that. Um, similarly, this was a study that just came out that Paul Ford and a colleague of his did. Uh, they looked at decision-making type of activities that coaches do in training, and in comparison to different leagues um, in the in Europe, and they found that in Spain and Portugal there was more decision-making type of practices, so more kind of playing form practices being done in those leagues than they were with the English and German players. Um, English players did more unopposed type of work and drills, whereas the German players did uh, more fitness work. Now, I don't know how this would be represented in the US, but I can um, I haven't done this kind of cataloging work apart from um, with that women's soccer team at WVU. Um, but uh, we might find something similar occur over here. So this just gives you a bit of background. So if this is the problem that if we're saying that uh, and the, a bit of the problem is that when we do this type of uh, drill activity we're only meeting the the domain needs in one learning domain which is the physical domain so they're getting maybe some uh well they're getting psychomotor type of or you know put your foot this way do this do that right um rather than kind of a more holistic package of um asking questions, um, being put in a situation where they can be more independent with their decision making, where their learning is social as well as physical. 
So this is a little bit of the problem of, of this, where they're all in row lines. There's no interaction. There's no cognitive thinking necessarily. Um, and they're not getting attuned to the affordances in the environment from a visual and perceptual kind of uh, situation. Whereas we need that information when we go to the play and form activities. And then we wonder why kids can't play games well, because they're never taught to play games. Um, so that so the answer was, if we take Simon Sinek's kind of idea, let's start with why. So the big idea of the, the games kind of thing is let's start with why. So let's put kids in a situation and start asking, um, you know, why we do something. So if, if you've got a skill like passing, why do we need that skill in the game? I mean, as coaches, we all know, but the kids might not know. So if we start with why, we can then work out from why and then think about, well, how do we do why? So that's the skill and movement. And then what kind of tactical awareness might we need to be able to match to the how to get back to the why we need something? Um, and uh, so the notion is that we focus on concepts within game-based coaching and teaching versus, uh, before skills. So the idea is maintain possession of the ball. I can have individual maintenance of possession. I'm talking a lot of soccer examples here because, you know, we're mainly involved with soccer. Uh, but we're shielding the ball individually, right? So maintain possession. And we have our d dribbling and manipulative skills and turns. But we also can maintain position as a, uh, possession as a small group. And for that, we need passing and receiving skills. Um, and the invasion game concepts that we tend to have, a, like I said, possession. And then what we need to do when we've got stable possession is move up the field because we're in an invasion game. And then we need to put the thing in the back of the net, which uh, is Willow's number third, which I didn't think he did very often. So there you go. But um, I don't know. I don't know what your scoring record was. Um, so <laughs> um, the teaching games understanding model was one, one of many game-based models. But this model looks something like this. And I'm trying to contextualize this again to the soccer audience because US soccer has just moved to this, what they call a play, practice, play model. And this was born out of uh, the original teaching games for understanding model, which basically started criticizing the way teachers taught physical education lessons back in the uh, late, late 1970s, early 1980s. And there was some work that went on with a group at Loughborough with a, with a bunch of teachers and an action research project in Coventry where they were getting them to think about how else can we attack this problem? And they were trying to think about putting the learner at the center of the process and thinking about, well, what do learners need? And trying to move away from just doing drills to also thinking about the game more holistically. So the notion was that was radical and it probably still is, Let's start the session with a game. So I have my kids out there and I am pretty like stuck on, I always start a session with a game. And the game that I found with my players, U11, kind of middle of the road team, you know, some good players and, you know, kids moving forward, um, 4v4, four goals, right? That's how a game we play at the start of the session, pretty much all the time that gets them attuned to everything in the environment. So as I move from there, I then have to ask questions to think about tactical awareness. So sometimes I bring them in, sometimes I just walk around and ask the individuals questions. I have my um, ph ph team philosophy kind of principles that I reinforce, like with playing out from the back and things like that. Um, so we, um, um, we, we talk about some of them, then what we do is, depending on the game and what's going on, we then look at skill execution practices, and that might be for any of the dribble, pass, shoot kind of areas. And then what we do is we go back into that 4v4 game, and then I expand that out into a you know 7v7 or a 9v9 game. So with the four goals, I would make two goals. And then there's got to be some transfer of what we were doing in the four goals to the game just going into the two goals. So that's how it works. Um, the, but the, the key thing is the learner is always at the center. The game, the initial game form is meets the needs of the learners. It's, it's small-sided because they get lots of touches. They get orientated to the ball. 
the tactical awareness questions are kind of at the level that is required for the players. Um, the skill execution that we do. So if you think about we do a keep away game, we might do 3v1, but we might think about restricting what the defender can do to give the three players more success. And then what we might be able to do is um, let that defender move a little bit more. Like we use sometimes hot defense, cold defense, that kind of thing. So you can see how all the time, no matter what we're doing, a game, the questioning, um, the skill execution, we're always trying to think about what are the developmental needs of the learner. Um, so that's that. Now, with a game bit, so that's the game understanding model. So we're, we're very focused on linking decision making and skill execution. So we're not separating them out. When we do drills, sometimes we go, oh, that's technical and that's tactical. Um, and I know in coach education, a lot of them don't do that. It's technical, tactical. But a lot of everything that we do is all technical and tactical. It's just along that playing form, training form, and depends on the needs of the learner. But if you take a game-based approach, there are four features design and manipulate practice games. And we'll come to like a, um, how we do that later. We use questions. We give opportunities for dialogue. So we get players in to talk to each other like a half-time team talk and that are tactical timeouts. Not too long, but you know, there's some challenges about how often we do this, why we do it and all this kind of thing. And then we, what we want to do as a coach is build a supportive moral environment. But sometimes the outcomes we get here, building the supportive moral environment, come from the use of questioning and the use of a more game-based approach. And if you look at the physical education literature, this is the biggest circle. Um, we get more kids involved in what's going on and more kids reporting from an effective standpoint that they enjoy PE more because they play games, right? Um, um, so Jason's asked a question, uh, Tom, do you go into a session with a particular main learning outcome? Yes, uh, we do. And that's all, that's a bit of a chicken and egg too, right? So how much do you plan for things? And that's some of the criticisms of the model is before it was just like, oh, you go set up a game and do a Bobby Robson session where he just goes, right? Oh yeah, we'll go do that. Add this player, do that, right? And this is related in Marino's book where he talks about Robson. It was all like, oh, we'll just build the session on the off the cuff kind of thing. Whereas Van Howell was like, no, we're doing this, this, this. There is a middle ground here where you can coach a little bit of what you see, but usually that initial game form is planned. The skill execution is planned because I've got my tactical concept I want to work on. So if it's maintaining possession, I know I'm going to go into some form of keep away game, but I might go from 3v1 to 3v2 or... 3v1 to 4v2, depending on how the kids are getting on. I might put them in streamed groups. I might put them all in the same group, right? In mixed groups, oh, that is some of the things that I do as I'm coaching. Um, so those are the four features. Um, so what does research say? Because when, when we start doing things that are different, people want to know, they want to compare, and this was another thing I should do. Well, they want to compare the chicken to the egg and say, well, is the chicken um, better than the egg or do we, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so what does the research say? So we did this literature review with uh, Paul, who's a PhD student of mine in Ireland. Um, he's at the University of Limerick and these are some of his colleagues, Marks, his supervisor, and Kieran, one of his co-supervisors with me. Um, and so I'm just going to talk about this study and what for practitioners who are coaches that are listening, we really want to focus on the left-hand side thing we we scoped the research or so any projects that said they were using some form of a game-based approach um, and whether that was an observational study or an intervention study where they were trying to compare a game-based approach to a traditional approach to coaching we searched the literature to find out who's done these types of studies and in what contexts and what did they find? What variables did they investigate? Did they look at decision making? Did they look at skill execution? This type of thing. Uh, and by the end, we were able to look at trends and gaps in research, but that's more of the academic side. But what we're interested in more of, well, what are the implications that we can draw from this research for coaches? You know, what do coaches, um, what outcomes can coaches expect if they move towards a game-based approach? Um, so in how was this studied? 
So in this literature view, what you do is you take all the research that's done and sort of put it into one compendium. You read all the articles, so that in this one there was 23, and we categorize them by sport, location, get because the different forms of game-based coaching and their cultural variations. So in America, we use this play practice play model a, a lot more, which is also called the tactical games model. Uh, in Australia, they call this game-based coaching game sense. Um, and it's 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 the same path up a different mountain, right? Um, it, the same idea is the four features. They're the central concepts in all of these cultural variations. Um, what we found was um, that soccer and rugby, there's a lot of research in there with the game-based coaching. That's possibly be, because with rugby, it was uh, um, rugby union in England particularly was an early adopter and there was some transition over. Uh, obviously, the All Blacks have had coaches like Wayne Smith who've been very much... Uh, using a game-based approach for a long time. So again, there's, there's been interest in that kind of uh, oceanic area uh, or Australasian area, uh, Australia, New Zealand with rugby. Um, and uh, there's also, because a lot of the research has been done in Australia, uh, it's been focused on this game sense uh, version of the TGFU. Um, and a lot of the research has been done with um, youth and adolescents. But there's also been a bunch of research done with elite teams. So there's a guy in Australia who's done a number of studies with elite coaches in New Zealand and Australia in a, in a rugby setting, uh, looking at why they use games and game-based coaching. Um, so that's how it was studied. And these are some of the trends. Uh, so what did we find? So what we did is when we looked at all the research, we tried to say, well, what are the four features of game-based coaching? Designing, questioning, dialogue. The, the positive environment, and we looked to see what we could find. So what we found was that in terms of design and manipulation of practice games, we looked at competitive performance components. So what, what are the implications for tactics, techniques, and physical like fitness outcomes? So we didn't find a lot to do with fitness outcomes. Coaches talked in these studies, talked a little bit about, um, oh, we use games and they're good to keep the fitness levels of the players, but we didn't really find any quantitative data to suggest that the, there was any positive outcomes for fitness by using games. Um, I've done some work in physical education context to, to suggest that physical activity uh, it is higher when you use a game-based approach. Um, I've also got some anecdotal reports from parents saying that their kids go to bed at night easily when they've had me as their coach and I've been coaching games. So there you go. Um, but what we found was um, tactically, there was some good evidence to suggest that if you use a game-based approach, you impact the tactical learning and decision-making, particularly things like off-the-ball support for those learners who participate in those sessions. And you think about it, you spend most of your time in a soccer game, Willow, you'll know, uh, running around without the ball, right? Especially when you're, um, you know, played at a higher level. So and you, for Mark, Steve. yeah, uh, yeah, and out on the wing, you know, and left back or whatever. Yeah. Just, yeah. He, yeah. Because you've plugged me three times, Steve. He, yeah. he just feels the need to just have a little, little yeah. prod and a poke every now and again. Bless him. So the the idea is that tactically we get those outcomes, right? Which you might say, well, um, that's a no-brainer. Right, uh, but technically, we we don't get the same outcomes. There isn't research to report that in a skill execution context that using game-based approaches in, improves skill learning or technical more technical skill learning rather than tactical skill learning. Now, one point I've always said about game-based research is it never shows that it gets any worse. So people say, oh, game-based approaches are no good for developing skill. Yeah, but they're not any worse than technical. And if you're getting all these extra outcomes, like, again, it's a no-brainer. So I, I just want to make that point. So when people look at research, you can get, you know, you're getting more bang for your buck. You can get your tactical outcomes and you can maintain your skill outcomes, right? Uh, if you use game-based coaching. Steve, can I, major, can I... Yeah. Can I ask a question on that? That and I'm a huge advocate of games-based approaches. It's completely transformed the way I think about player development and even coach development. Now, one of the questions 
I get thrown at me a lot or I've even noticed in my own sessions is when there's a disparity in ability level, can the lower ability level players in the group disconnect from a games based approach because they don't quite have that skill acquisition or technical proficiency to join in sometimes? Yes, so I did a study in physical education and we had different games going on and the games were streamed, but still you had some players who might be, or students who were maybe at the lower echelons of their level. Um, and some of those children got less touches on the ball and they did more work off the ball. So there's some evidence there to suggest that yes, um, some learners can be disadvantaged if we want to use that term um, and thus that might if they're getting less touches on the ball then think now a, a solution to that is um, and I think uh, well Tom might have been there at the United Soccer Coaches Convention they did a nice session with him and uh, Michael Supp and a couple of the FA guys where you move from things like 1v1s to 3v3s to 7v7s and back so there are ways in which, again, it comes back to planning and designing good games, right? If you plan and design the games in a way and, and give people that, you know, so you might have wing players. Well, everyone takes turns going out on the wing. And you might even say, well, some kids will spend more time out on the wing as the wing players. Um, you might do games that divide kids by section, right? Or allow some kids to move between two. I do ones where, you, you know, two kids stay in one half, two in the other. and Two kids are allowed, you know, midfielders are allowed to go. Put certain kids who you need to get more touches to in as the midfield players, right? And, and therefore, um, they're getting more touches and things like that. So I just think we've got to be smart about the way that we plan and design the games and also think about how we design our sessions so that there's something there for everyone, right? Um, and Steve, that's, that's coaching, right? Like, let's let's not overlook it that that's the beauty of being able to to attend to the needs of each learner you said that this model is perfect when you keep the, the learner in the game at the center of it i think and we'll, we'll come back obviously to, to everything that you're saying but i think often there's a misrepresentation of the the game will do the teaching like the game is the teacher well yeah but it's also about how the game is structured and what the coach is doing to to ensure that individually the needs of each player are being met so you mentioned earlier the concept of affordances of, of affording opportunities for certain actions to be seen you know mm -hmm. we've spoke, we've had conversations in the past about certain constraints and conditions that can be put on things so that you know i think the situation that mark's mark's suggesting the answer would be that as a as a coach we have to we have to step in we have to coach we have to change something we have to offer a solution that allows for that person to to still achieve success right i i agree and another thing is i mean life more broadly not everyone is going to get the same opportunities touches on the ball like metaphorically and but we need to construct society and other things we do in life in such a way to um, create more affordances for certain people so that they can um play more of an active part in what goes on in society. So yes, games are somewhat a reflection of, you know, the dog eat dog, the Darwinism in the society, but we can put structures in place in those games. Um, like I, there's the coaching cards that Jack Rolf has and, um, you know, the, the Magic Academy have done as well. And those types of things say, you can have a star player and if you get the ball, you're allowed X touches. If you get the ball, you're only allowed Y touches. So those are nice things to bring out. Uh, like, so you have superpowers for one kid and you can maybe sometimes orientate those powers around to certain children, depending on what the needs of the session are and things like that. But I think that half the time when you're planning sessions and um, delivering sessions, we're a bit restrictive with ourselves as coaches. Um, a great thing that I also use is like these action fantasy games. So I wrote out um, eight, uh, game situations that happened to us over the course of the first part of the season this past fall and I brought them to training and uh, I laid them out on the floor or if it was you know raining or whatever I held them and I just got one of the kids up and said right choose and the kids chose one and it was like right you're losing 3-1 
there's 10 minutes of the game left. You know, this is your team, that's the other team. Crack on. And we played seven on seven. And um, that was, part, you know, a part of the session we were doing. I did one at the start of the session and one at the end. And I did some stuff in the middle. And what I was trying to get the kids to understand was kind of like we've got to be able to manage the game. And you have to be the ones that manage the game. Like, I can't do it. And I will be honest with you, as soon as we did those games, I saw a remarkable change. And it's anecdotal, I understand. But I did see a change in the way that my kids were playing out on the field when they were playing the game. Um, so that comes down again to that personal and social development. Those fantasy games, they create that effective domain development. They create enthusiasm. Kids want to come back tomorrow. And that's the main thing we're here for, particularly in the youth space. I mean, I read this thing, uh, NHL put out this graphic on Twitter, like about how many kids actually make it to the NHL, right? I mean, so why are we all there? I mean, we're all connected. We've been for, um, you know, social at the United Soccer Coaches. We all have something to draw us together. It's soccer. We all played to whatever degree level, but we're all now doing the same thing. We share the same interest. We've got our own community of practice, and it's all because... It was sport that brought that, and soccer particularly, that brought us to it. And a lot of kids, we need to give them that experience in uh, in sport um, so they want to come back. And I still play over 40s, and it's a bit of a laugh, but I'm still involved, right? And that's good because it keeps me healthy and things like that. So this personal social development is really important, and that was what some of the findings suggested that Kids report, uh, you know, a little bit more autonomous motivation, which means they're volition to come to the sessions. They want to come back tomorrow, that kind of thing. Um, so that it side's important. And then on the questioning side, um, the conceptual shifts are things to do with coaches. And Ed's on the, the call here. He, him and I and a couple of others did a study where we looked at coaches' questioning practice. And although coaches were using questions, they were using them in a very uh, monologue like closed way just to get a response from someone, but then they would go back into telling the kids what to do, right? Whereas what you want to do is like have a reflective toss when you use questions because you want to put out the question, get a couple of responses, and then say, all right, Tom, uh, Mark's just said this. What do you think, Tom? How, how did you think that that was going? And trying throw the ball around a little bit right um, but with with coaches it's just um, some of the shifts we've seen are just they change instruction to close questions so they think that they're asking questions which they are but they're just not asking good questions right so that's a problem because um, conceptual shifts are kind of thinking about what is learning about what is a good session right so a good session isn't standing in lines it's not doing what the coach tells it's coming up with your ideas being creative using tricks that you've never used before that kind of thing uh, and another problem is coach education because a lot of the coach educators we have haven't gone through maybe the process like mark was just saying he'd gone through where he's tried some of these things out in his own coaching and then he's in a space where he's working with other coaches so he's gone through that conceptual shift and sometimes some of the coach educators haven't gone through that so then coach education is behind sometimes what's going on in practice um, or what's going on particularly in the academic uh, world like we still see references to learning styles when they've been quite highly criticized so that's where sometimes coach education is behind um you know and then opportunities to dialogue and discussion again we're not recommending, and this research is not recommending this literature review, that we stand there for hours asking kids questions and giving them opportunities to chat uh, and not be physically active. We've come up with some ideas of a 70-30 rule. Right? Get kids moving 70% of the time, 30% maybe they are. And that's what Beyond Pulse is about, right? So you try to get kids moving with the active participation most of the session, but you understand that there's going to be some downtime for water breaks, the kids to bounce ideas off each other, to have dialogue with the coach, that kind of thing. But your, I think your metrics are around about 70% too, right? So that's commensurate with what we're trying to get. But that cultural shift um, for building in time for discussion are important. 
but again the idea of not doing that overdoing it if you know what I mean so the, these were the main things so some of the to bring this back round for key take home messages so I can be uh, get done with uh, the session here uh, planning is extremely important Paul who did a lit review his study with the Gaelic uh, coaches found because he, he got some high level Gaelic coaches to talk about how they plan for game based coaching and they go to the utmost lengths and it's like the John Wooden thing right two hour practice two hour plan and sometimes with youth coaches that's the challenge we 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 might see that US soccer struggle with the player practice player because coaches don't plan but they're trying to give them ways in which not to have to plan the sessions if you know what I mean um game design is really important and the balance between coaching what you see versus coaching what you planned is important but that's where Goldilocks comes in as well. Not trying to manipulate the variables and the task constraints too much, where the game becomes so clumsy that the kids can't play it. Right? If you say, "Oh, you've got to run around three cones on the field before you shoot," that's not realistic. Right? No one would do that. Um, so what you need to do is think about your game design, and it's not too hot. I.e., there's not too many task constraints, but it's not too weak that you're not putting kids in that stretch challenge zone. Right, you want kids to think and act, but you don't want it to be clumsy. Uh, similarly, um, games promote decision making, and that's an important part of what we're trying to do within. Like, as you would know, Fergie couldn't play the game for you when you're on the field, but what he could do is teach you, and his coaches can teach you uh, the skills to do that from training, so you could translate that to the game, and that comes probably from doing a lot of game based training, and then. Um, we know that research in game-based uh, is there's only 23 studies, so we need more studies to to sort of figure out what we're doing here. Uh, so what can we do as coaches? Design the learning environment. Now I like this idea of uh, start with the end in mind. So if you're going to get to X game or you want X feature to be coming through in the game at the end, start with that at the start. Don't wait till the end. Um, you know, it's like tell them what you're going to tell them tell them and then tell them what you just told them kind of idea right um and this is where uh, tom this sort of three-part model comes in the learner the environment and the task so you've got to understand the needs of the developmental needs of the learner depending on their age and stage of development you've got your task constraints and i'll come to that in a second and the environment like play on turf play with futsal play with a small ball play with a big ball so uh, play in wet conditions and dry conditions that kind of thing so that's your environment and this all these three things affect the perception and action of the players to create movement solutions and the more variability you have in practice the more attuned they are to that so when they get to the playing environment i.e the real game they can deal with it coolly right without without much problem um here's a a picture I found on the web when I looked at slanty line theory. So you can imagine when we all were in PE and we had the high jump, the teacher could put the bar like this and some kids would go over here and some kids would jump higher here. So this is this idea that we might have kids the same age, some are going into this hoop, some in that one and some in that one. But this is just a, a park or a whatever, I don't even know where it is, but I just thought this was a good graphic. So you might have in your training session three keep away things going on with kind of different task constraints to meet the needs of those different learners um, and then these are some ways to manipulate those task constraints because really as coaches this is the business and again i'm not saying that none of us do this as coaches right we've been doing this since the late 1960s early 70s right um condition games or modify they were called condition games back then that we've been part of the repertoire of coaches ever since then. Right? You read Walter Winterbottom and go back, it's all there. But rules are all listed here. Um, so like scoring systems, I sometimes have a different coloured ball in training. And when I roll that ball in, it's three points a goal, right? And um, so it's like a green ball that one of the kids brings. So when the green ball's in, it's three points a goal. Let's go. So it's any game that we're playing, it just fires people up. Right, and then I take it out and we play with the white ball or whatever the other um, equipment we could play again, like I was saying, with small balls, big balls. Um, sometimes you could play 
frisbee games, you, you know, to, to teach them how to do off the ball movements and things like that. Um, you can look at size of the goals or targets and things like that. You can look at um, um, number of attackers v defenders. We do this all the time, right? 7v5. I do games 9v4. And then we move from there. And then playing area is here too. Um, and you know position of goals so wide goals goals up and down right uh diagonal like when doing keep away i had a coach who was saying oh i've got a problem because when i do square keep away um the kids just stand in the corners and don't move i said put them in a circle and so sometimes doing rondos and people give rondos a bad rap but do them in different formats right do it where you blow a whistle and kids have to change different groups so there's ways you can sort of change um, and then to sort of finish off, I've got uh, last two slides. So this is, these are some small game principles that came through England hockey that were adopted by USA field hockey. So make things fun. Make it so that people get more touches on the ball. Have stretch so you get in that ugly or deep learning zone. But, you know, Goldilocks, not too hard, not too easy. Um, look something like the game. And I would say even when you're doing drills, try and do something to stimulate some perception action where it links to something more so don't just have kids running around cones right do something that they're going to do in between so sometimes you know just something daft like you hold up a red cone a yellow cone and they have to say something i've had kids do keep away with red and yellow cones so if they want the ball they hold up the red cone um or the yellow cone and the, the person passing has to shout the color and uh, the color cone they're holding up before they pass Right, and so that means that there's something extra for them to do. So they've got to get their head up and look to where they're passing, so they don't hit a blind pass. Um, and then you've got constant decision making, too. Um, so this is how you can manage the chicken and egg. It's not an either or; it's moving along the spectrum. And you can make drills more game-like, and you can make games more like drills. Um, and then the final thing that coaches need to do is ask questions to, uh, and one model we use is from Timothy Galway's book. It's really simple. Bring the kids in. What's the goal of the game? How are we getting on with that? What's the reality? How are we getting on? What are some different ways in which we can attack this problem to maintain possession of the ball? What's our one thing we're going to do differently when we go back out and play? Right, play. And once the kids get into a cycle of doing the grow model, they can do it themselves. And I have a leadership group and I have small teams. So if I have 16 players, I make four teams and they do warm ups together and things like that. So I give that leader in that group the card and have them take their group. And I just stand there and listen in and ask prompt questions. So that's questioning. So that's my uh, wrap. I probably went off ad lib a couple of times, so it's fine. I know we've got one question here. Uh, so, um, Mikhail, uh, Mikhail um, says, do you give players the opportunity to lead sessions, uh, create rules for the drill? Yes. Um, I'm sorry I missed that, uh, Mikhail. Very much so. Um, I, I always think about a lot of us probably heard of deliberate play and deliberate practice so sometimes when we do the games even though they're games kids think it's deliberate practice sometimes when kids create their own games it's more like deliberate play sometimes you have to show kids like those fantasy games i was talking about you might give kids the parameters and they come up with the game right so i give kids the, the chance to do that i give um i print off laminated cards game cards and I give those to the kids and say, right, you're 4v4, this is the game, go set it up, you've got one minute to get it set up. So I, I know I've designed that game, but I do that kind of thing. I get kids to peer teach each other a lot, either using cards or just teaching each other skills. Like if someone knows the Ronaldo chop, I get that kid to teach it to another kid. Um, and I also give kids the opportunity to come up with games. So I might start with just a four on four game and say, right, how do you want to move from here? And I also give kids the chance to do free play. So they all like to play Wembley doubles. So they do that once or twice a week because that's their 
thing that they like to do. Steve, can um, I can I ask on that? Um, you mentioned earlier uh, that games by nature seem to increase the volition of players to want to come back. It increases motivation. So what you've been speaking about there seems to me to link really nicely to the concept of self-determination theory and concepts that go into increasing motivation for children to, to play and practice and perform. So is that um, by letting by letting players have involvement, I'm assuming that that's very deliberate from you, not just because you know that, oh, they might like this, but that there's there's research behind why you feel that way. Is that is that accurate? And if it is, can you extend upon it a little bit more? Yes, yeah, so the, the basic psychological needs inherent in uh, self-determination theory are autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Um, now, competence, you've got two sides, you've got perceived and actual competence, and this could be a problem uh, because some people say, well, it's we want to demonstrate actual competence rather than perceived competence. Uh, but generally, autonomy is the way into competence development and it's the way into um, relatedness, right? So if you can create autonomy in the sessions where kids feel that, all oh, right, coach gives me the opportunity to, like how could do the session, I'll say, right, go off and work on something for five minutes, get in small groups, get over it, go. I don't care what you're doing. Um, and that then kids have to kind of self-organize. Uh, there's a bit of autonomy there. Similarly, I have structured autonomy where, I, like I said, I give them some things to do, but they have to do it. Um, and I have a leadership group. Um, we came up with our core values for our group, yeah. for our kids' soccer team. Um, and, um, you know, those are all deliberate strategies by me. But, yes, they're all there to increase autonomy so that they, they open the door for kids to build relationships with me and each other, and then also to feel a sense of perceived competence that they're moving forward in their in their game. Yeah, and I think that is, I think it's so critical to any, to, to coaches listening that Steve referenced right at the start, the why was at the center of things, that if, if you guys can go and understand why you make the decisions that you do, and and how it obviously attends to the needs of the learner and, and what it offers them then it's it's the sweet spot so um that is something it's it's an area of research that if you're less familiar with i would i would definitely encourage going and looking at it um willow you popped your mic on and then there's a question from kelly steve so willow do you want to go and then more one observation and one question and and it, again it's linked to the, the the play practice play model steve and the questions based on some of the, the discussion we had on, on Ed's brilliant webinar um, regarding um, working memory. But the first, the first piece of the, the, the question is, I, I found that when I'm able to, or when I deliver a play practice play session, I'm able to remove myself more and observe what I think is one of the most important things. And this is just in my humble opinion, the emotions and behaviors that players have when they receive a piece of information. And I think, you know, the, the, the game's the game at the start. And even if you want to coach a little bit in the, in the, in a practice piece in the middle, when you're able to just set the, the rules and then step back, you can look at every, even a disparity in ability levels across your group and look for the responses, emotional responses to the information given and then how that manifests itself in behavior. So I think it's a great, a great, um, way for you as a coach to grow and develop by looking at something different other than the x's and o's and the the, the second piece is ed and i and, and tom discussed this on the uh, on his webinar about working memory so how conscious are you of the volume of information you give within a practice given that some of the research shows that we're only able to receive up to three pieces of information and probably you know store maybe one um, that we can use again the next time we come back out on the field. Yeah, great observations and questions. I want to go back to someone said in the chat, do I use play practice play all the time? Um, there is a, a model called the clinic game day model come from Australia where it's kind of like, say you have two sessions a week in a competitive game, you'd have your game, then you would do your competitive game against another team 
or an inter squad game, whatever. Then you'd do your skill learning, and then you'd have a game day, right, where you might do some, or you might use play, practice, play, right? So I don't do every session play, practice, play. I do most that way. But sometimes if I've got like a game and then a session and then a game, and I mean competitive game, I might do more technical learning in a session. I also try and have a session every week where I do a bit of a focus on speed and agility and maybe plyos, a one on strength. So I try and build that fitness element in too, right? And then I have one session a week that's more technically orientated and then the rest are more like play, practice play, but I just wanted to get that in there. Um, I think Adrian Turner and some colleagues said that game-based approaches can be a vehicle for letting coaches have the opportunity to change their coaching behaviors and practice. And I think that that mirrors what you have just said, Mark, that I think if we want to open ourselves up, and the simplest thing I would say to coaches right now is um, start more sessions with the game. And that will just um, and or increase the amount of time spent in game based or, or playing form practices because that's an easy win for you. It's a low hanging fruit. You've got control over that. Um, and don't worry so much about the drills because kids will learn some of the foot skills and technical components as they get older. Like I, I was out with badminton one time with a middle school and a sixth grader couldn't hit the shuttle. Um, and a seventh grader walked in and could whack it fine. And I would class them both as pretty moderate at other activities, right? So what that told me is sometimes there's a developmental thing, and this will relate to Ed's presentation, where sometimes things just click for kids at a certain time and age. And sometimes we try and force them into doing something that they're not quite ready for. Um, like I waited for my kids to be able to ride a bike. And so all I needed to do was I got on a little downhill. I held onto the handlebar and went, Psh, and they just started riding, right? So I didn't go through all this getting frustrated trying to teach them uh, because I, I left it developmentally till I knew that they were ready. Um, and I think what I've done with it, to answer your other question about storing things in short-term working memory, what I've done with my team is I gave them a, a card and uh, we chatted about things and I came up with some uh, um, way of getting across simple in bits of information that could lead into very complex things. So um, FTO is a thing that I, I remind kids about. FTO means force to the outside. So that's how one of our defensive principles. So if I'm there um, coaching, I'll just say FTO, FTO, FTO. And I don't need to stop the session. We don't need to have dialogue about it. We've had a bit of the dialogue, you know, in one of our team meetings. The kids know what falls to the outside. I can then maybe pull a kid out one by one and remind them of the technique. If it's a problem for the whole group and it is a more of a defensive session we're doing, or I've got that in my like macro cycle plan, I will deal with that when we get to it, right? So, but that's a, an example of, of how I've tried to do what you said, Mark, is that force to the outside is a principle of play in terms of delaying the attack, for, for example. And that's how I've built it into my uh, structure with my team. So I have a simple prompt word. And as soon as I say that prompt word, the kids know exactly what I mean by it. Perfect. There's a, there's a question at the bottom, Steve. Um... Oh, yeah, from... Uh... There was one from uh, Kelly, right? Uh, what about the youngest age groups? Is there research to the youngest age groups uh, about tactical awareness, not just wanting to come back uh, and cultural? Do so the problem that we've had with the game-based research, and it's kind of ironic, is um, uh, people, because there's even a thing with researchers that they don't think they can teach young kids how to play games, right? So we don't do research with young people about games. We wait till they're old enough to do the research. So in a lot of ways, we haven't really got an answer to that question. Uh, but what I would do is say, if we go to the more development research, um, like there was a study done in games about herding behavior. 
So what they did is they manipulated the task constraints. So they had one game with two goals at one end and two at the other. And they had one game with just one goal at either end. And they also, uh, in the herding condition, they told kids, they gave them some things about like, when you lose the ball, get the ball back within five seconds or something like that. Um, so with the two goals and the prompts to do certain things on defense, the, the, the kids spent more time clust, clustered and clumped together. Um, and th this wasn't young, like youngest kids, but I'm trying to think about what young kids do when they play games, they, they cluster together. Um, to be quite honest, I would probably, as a coach now, especially after this season, I don't know why we put kids on a pitch and just give them two goals to shoot into, because it just forces everyone to clump together. So that was the herding condition. But when you put in four goals and kids can go anywhere, they all space out. So kids get the opportunity then to run with the ball, to get the ball out of their feet, in some ways to get their head up, but kids have a visual attention that's like this. And that's what I'm saying about developmental patterns is if kids uh, have got a narrow visual attention anyway, what they're not doing is getting their head up, right? And so it's very hard to teach kids to do that until they get to a certain age, which probably is about eight, nine, and 10. And some kids will get there before others, like in terms of seeing the bigger picture. But there is things like we can do as coaches, like we can stop yelling at kids because that causes stress and anxiety that further narrows the visual attention of young people. Uh, well, all of us. Um, and, but what we can do is ask more questions or give more simple prompts that gets kids to get their head up and look for certain things in the environment. Uh, and it always gets me to think about Clive Woodward's uh, CTC, right? So it, it's crossbar touchline so it's touchline kind of touchline crossbar so after every time the ball moves the kids have to look at the crossbar the touchline crossbar and i'm doing that slowly but you know his players could do that really quickly so i think um the answer to the question is complicated but we don't have a lot of research with really young people the only stuff we have is like more to development um research um and cultural differences between countries. I would say that um, going back to that study that was done with the youth youth academies, that there is more of a culture in Spain and Portugal, and in you you know that part of that Mediterranean part to sort of open things up a lot more within games and let kids play. Whereas in the US, as we all see, we go to a game and we stand on the sideline and thousands of people are screaming at the kids, and I'm just like, I don't know how the kids play. Um, and I think it's very difficult as coaches how we tell parents to be quiet, um, but also coaches, like Mark said, need to be responsible too. Um, I don't believe that these like silent games are the way forward, because I think you have to take advantage. If kid, if a kid needs feedback, you should give it to them, um, and just saying, "Oh, I can't give them feedback because it's a silent day." I think that that is not, you know, it might stop people for a short term um but i don't think that that's a long-term answer right uh, i've heard i've heard things like thinking thursday sessions and i get it you want a theme for the session but does that mean you don't think on other days so it you know I, i'm just being like devil's advocate so so go on Tom. i'm curious just just on that point um maybe with the fact that the us while it's definitely getting better with the the cultural growth that's being seen in the game especially at the youngest ages how young kids playing might help their you know game awareness and, and intelligence um because maybe culturally they're at a disadvantage to you know europe and south america based on how little you know soccer or football is is, is played or is part of their everyday life around them what Obviously, without research, just curious as to what your thoughts might be there off the back of Kelly's last question. Yeah, and I'm just typing to, to everyone here that there is a, Paul Ford, who did that other study that I talked about, the one with European um, development um, there with decision making. Paul did some other talent ID research where he talked about early engagement being important. So if a if a child doesn't play soccer at an early age, it's going to be a little bit harder to catch up later down the, the line. Um, 
but if they have that early engagement and we can kind of facilitate the learning environment so the kids want to come back to stay with the sport it might not be that they enter club soccer at an early age or in an academy but if they have an early experience and get to know how the game works and then play other sports and then when they're ready they want to specialize that's kind of what we need because they will you know there's multiple benefits of that from burnout the stress injury Oh, and a whole host of other like psychological factors as well as physical factors. Yeah, I don't know if that's answering your question, but that that's kind of a, another kind of theory that's out there. That kind of idea of early engagement, so not early spe specialization, not necessarily early diversification, but just some type of early engagement in the activity. Yeah, perfect. And um, last question from me, and and I would little call to action for for people listening. If you have anything more, please pop it in the chat. Um, I mentioned Stephen in the very brief kind of intro to you at the start and and we haven't obviously centered any of this conversation around it outside of of games based approaches to teaching and coaching you know one of your core research areas is coach behavior um and I'm and I'm curious as to whether you have any advice or recommendations for the coaches listening um as to potentially what core coaching behaviors um or what the core coaching behaviours could be that that would support an effective use of of a games based approach. Um, yeah, yeah, we've done some studies looking at playing form, training form, practice, and looking at different types of coaching behaviours that coaches use. Um, the summation of those studies are that coaches have what Chris Cushman would probably call like a bit of a shoot from the hip kind of way of coaching behavior. So they don't try and match their coaching behavior to the the intentions of the practice, if you know what I mean. So what I mean is if they want to shout, they'll just shout anyway, whether it's a game or a practice or, or a drill or whatever. Uh, and I don't mean shouting about it. I mean, like if they want to instruct and give feedback. Um, so I think when you're planning, you should try and plan your behaviors and not maybe even do it where in the game I'm just going to stay silent because the kids have to play but you might want to think about if you're going to say certain things what things are you going to say um, or what prompts might you verbally or cues might you give people uh, and is that related to what it is that you want from that game do, do you see what I mean so there's some alignment between your behavior and what it is that you're doing in practice but it goes down to this thing about planning because we don't really plan. Not only do we not take time to plan sessions a lot of the time, we don't therefore then plan our behaviors. So then when we go out there, we're all, we're all at sea, right? We're all off the cuff on our practice and it maybe drifts off into a way we don't want it to go. And then our behaviors do the same. Uh, but the core behaviors one would assimilate with a game-based approach would be questioning. Um, silence, which should be used not because you don't have anything to say, but as an actual deliberate coaching strategy. Um, and like I've set this game up, I'm going to be silent for the first few minutes to give them time to work out the tactical problem. And then I'm going to step in, ask them a tactical awareness question. So that would be a what question. What are you seeing going on when you're playing in this game? Um, and then, then I might then ask questions about how, which are the skill execution questions. Um, so those would be things that would come through, like as we play that game a little bit longer, or get into that uh, drill, if you want to use that word, uh, a little bit later. So the the notion is that you need to plan those practices. But I don't like to get this exclusiveness, like oh. Uh, Technical coaches don't ask questions and tactical coaches don't give technical feedback. To me, that's um, that's a, 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 a ridiculous demarcation. We need to be more nuanced with our behavior than that. And it goes back to, like I say, planning the behaviors. But there are some behaviors like asking questions that are more commensurate with um, game-based approaches and less instruction and more deliberate silence um but again they're not exclusive to the different types of approaches 
Yeah, thank you. And I, and I just think for, for the coaches, sometimes perhaps you overlook or we overlook um, the value of, of silence and observation as an intentional behavior. You know, it's not simply that you're not doing anything, um, which can often be you know misinterpreted. So um, thank you, Steve, for, for that clarity and, and the insight. Um, well, I don't have anything from you. From me, I'm, I'm very conscious, Steve, that we've stolen almost 75 minutes of your time. Um, I know there's been some some dialogue on the chat. If there's if there's any more questions, please speak now or forever hold your peace. Obviously, it's uh, it's not every day we get to pick the brains of somebody who's as well versed in this field as, as Steve is. So, please um, please do fire anything through that might be left. And um, I guess if oh yeah. It's just a so thank you if there if there isn't um to everybody that's listening now and and obviously on demand later again thank you for for choosing beyond pulse we hope that that you found that uh informative and enlightening i'm, I'm sure you did it was some great content steve thank you so much for sharing um for the for people listening now we wrap the week up as as steve had mentioned earlier with with mr sam snow the former director of coaching for us youth soccer tomorrow um and somebody who's another huge advocate of, of a games-based approach and how it can be used for the benefit of, of young youthful player development um but yeah steve thank you for for ever so much for, for your time you obviously have it on the screen but just a little uh, a little shout out as well uh where can people get hold of you obviously there's a wealth of information that, that you have to share so how can uh, how can they find you yeah um they can email harvey s3 at ohio.edu um, I have a website, it's just my Twitter handle and then .weebly.com, uh, there's a TGFU resources page and a one-stop shop on there for coaches who are new to the game. You can also contact me uh, through that website and that'll go to my email address, uh, another email address, but um, you can also get me on Twitter at Dr. Stephen Harvey, sorry it's long, uh, and you can send me a message, um, you know, an open message and then I can get a direct message once we follow each other because I think you have to do that to get direct messages. So those three, email, via the website or via Twitter. Perfect. Well, we'll call it there. So Steve, again, thank you so much on behalf of myself and, and Willow, um, all of Team Beyond Pulse, everybody that listened now and, and those listening later. Thank you ever so much for, for sharing your time with us this Thursday. And uh, to everybody else, we hope we, uh, we see you again on another Inside Coach conversation. So thanks, everybody.